Sevgili izleyiciler, hem Yapı Kredi Kültür Sanatlı Hoca da bu akşam bizimle birlikte olan izleyicilerimiz, hem de Yapı Kredi Kültür Sanat yayıncılığın YouTube kanalından bizi izleyen izleyicilerimiz. Hepiniz hoş geldiniz. Ben Yapı Kredi Kültür Sanat Yayıncılık Etkinlikler Yöneticisi Ahsen Erdoğan. Dear audience, welcome to our conference. I'll go on English in, in a few seconds. Bu akşam çok kıymetli bir tarihçi, Sean McMeekin'i, gerek dünya tarihi açısından, Gerekse e, bugün Rusya ve Ukrayna'da olup bitenleri daha iyi kavramamız açısından büyük önem taşıyan bir konuda konuşması için Loja'ya davet ettik. E, etkinliğin duyurularında da belirttiğimiz üzere e, konuşma dili, konferansın dili İngilizce olacak ve herhangi bir ardıl çeviri ya da simultane çeviri olmayacak. Ancak daha sonra e, Türkçe altyazılı versiyonunu YouTube kanalımızda sizlerle paylaşacağız. Bunun duyurularını da sosyal medya kanallarımızdan Takip edebilirsiniz. Dear guests, both those who are with us here at Loja, at Yapı Kredi Culture and Arts Building in Istanbul, and those who are watching the conference on our YouTube channel, all of you are welcome to our conference. I am Ahsen Erdoğan, Yapı Kredi Culture and Art Publishing Events Manager. Tonight, we are hosting a very famous historian, Sean Meek Meekin, to speak on a subject that is of great importance for both world history and our understanding of what's going on in Russia and Ukraine today. Thank you for being here. Thank you for having me. Professor Sean McMeekin was born in Idaho, United States, and educated at Stanford University and University of California, Berkeley. His works focus on European history of the early 20th century, especially the origins of the First World War and the role of Russia and the Ottoman Empire in the world. He's current, he is currently teaching uh, European history and culture at Bard College in New York. He previously taught at Koch University, Bilkent University, and Yale University. Four of McMeekin's books have been published in Turkish. Two of these were published by our public publishing house, Yapu Kredi Publications, one of which is the, origins, the Russian origins of the First World War, which is the title of our conference. I want to show the book to you. And the second is uh, The Ottoman Endgame, War, Revolution, and the Making of the Modern Middle East, 1908-1923. And it's here. Nureddin El Husseini translated both books into Turkish. And his other books, Stalin's War, A New History of the World War II, was published by the Chronic Kitab. The Ber Berlin Badat Express was released by Picus Publications. Many of McMeekin's books were awarded or nominated. McMeekin objects to the widely accepted thesis uh, regarding First World War in his books. At tonight's conference, he will open up his such objections as he sets out in his book, the, the Russian Origins of the First World War. We believe that this conference will also shed light on the origins of the Russia-Ukraine war, which is going on right next to us uh, right now. At the end of the conference, we can get your questions in Loja and in the chat section of our YouTube channel. Thank you all, and I leave the floor to Mr. McMeekin now. Thank you. Thank you, Asen, for that kind introduction, and thank you also to, uh, to Tulai Hanim and Yapi Kredi Publishers for arranging this event, and those who have attended here in person, Galinizicin, Chok Teshe Kirlirim. To those on YouTube, I hope you join us and, and perhaps can stick around when the Turkish translation is published if you're having trouble following the English. I am known at times to rattle on rather quickly once I get going, and so uh, I'll try not to do so too egregiously here. Uh, I have to say, though, to start out with, I'm actually a bit jealous of, of uh, Yapikredi's title for the book. You know what? Let's go back to the Yapikredi title. Could we have that for another moment? Rusyan in Rolu, just the, the first page, perhaps we could get the, the title back up. Um, I know you're trying to help me out by moving to my own slides, but um, I actually wanted to linger just for a moment over this title. Here we go. So what's interesting about this is that I think this is actually a better title than the book was given in English. Uh, Russian in Rolu. Effectively, we're looking here at the role of Russia in the First World War. An important role, yes, um, but Russia is not necessarily being blamed as such 
uh, for the war. Uh, it's a problem I've actually had with some of my publishers over the years. Um, publishers and authors don't always have exactly the same interests at heart. And so Harvard University Press, which published the original edition of this in English, uh, they actually objected to my own title to the book. My own title was not this elegant, but I thought in some ways uh, was actually quite practical. My own title for the book was Russia's Aims in the First World War, uh, which some of you might recognize if you're familiar with the historiography of the conflict as something of an homage to the English version of a very famous book published by the German historian Fritz Fischer. Germany's aims in the First World War. Interestingly, he had uh, something of uh, a similar problem with his own German publisher. The original German title of that book was almost as provocative as the title of the Russian origins of the war. It was called Griff nach der Weltmacht, that is to say Germany's grab for world power, which is quite evocative and led to a huge conversation, and that book really dominated much of the conversation on the war of the 1960s, 70s, and frankly almost up to the present day. Now, that book was, to some extent, yes, an indictment of German war aims, of German responsibility, to some extent, for the outbreak of the conflict. Um, what a lot of the Fisherites, that is to say, not Fisher himself, but his acolytes, his followers, historians who kind of trod in his footsteps, what they forgot was that in the original German edition of this book, he made a really interesting comment about his own work and where it came from. He said that he was able to write this book about Germany's aims in, or the German grab for world power again, depending on your version of the title, because the German archives were all open. After the Second World War, after 1945, after all, Germany was, aside from being bombed essentially into smithereens, essentially an open book when it came to source access. Yes, many documents had been destroyed in the bombing, but those that still existed were completely open to researchers. And in fact, a lot of the material on, on the Nazi German period, for example, was actually copied, photographed, or in some cases actually taken wholesale, either by the Soviets back to Moscow or by the Americans back to Washington. And so the historiography really of both world wars, I think, has been marked by this ever since. There's just a kind of almost superfluidity of access to the German material, which led to this obsession, really, in the public conversations of the war with Germany's war aims, with Germany's strategy, with what the Germans were up to. And yes, some of this goes all the way back to the post-war drama with the Versailles Conference and the famous Article 231 regarding Germany's alleged guilt for the war, the alleged basis for the reparations clause, the reparations Germany was supposed to pay after the war, uh, the last installment of which was actually paid off, believe it or not, in 2010. Uh, the Germans did actually pay in the end. Um, but because of this, again, the conversation, I think, got rather distorted. Uh, one of the things I discovered when I first started studying the subject intensively is that a lot of the books published before Fisher's book first came out in 1961 were actually more balanced. Uh, the three volumes published by the Italian journalist Luigi Albertini, for example, which came out kind of in between 1945 and 1961, were quite balanced. They look at all the different powers, uh, not necessarily equally, but they took seriously all of the different powers. Uh, after 1961, people simply stopped talking about things like uh, French war aims or France, France's reasons for fighting in 1914 or what the Russians were up to. What Fisher did say, again the part that everyone forgot, in the very first edition of his book he said we can write this book about Germany because the archives are open. Someday, he said, the archives of France, Britain, and Russia might be opened and then we could write a book about them too. Everyone forgot that part. Somehow it just kind of got lost in the shuffle, utterly forgotten. Um, and in fact, because of the 100-year law, a lot of the files, particularly in places like Britain, were not actually open until relatively recently. But the problem is, once these things get grooved by repetition, by constant massaging of the same kind of basic argument about German war guilt, the conversation moves on and people simply lose interest in topics such as, for example, Russian interest in the Ottoman Straits. Um, for example, what... Russia's ambassador to France was up to in July 1914. It turns out, and there used to be this argument, um, that the Germans had burned their papers and therefore they had tried to hide the scent of their crime. Uh, actually, it turns out we know it, an astonishing amount about what the Germans were saying, writing, thinking, and doing in July 1914. Whereas in the files of, for example, the Russian ambassador to France and the French ambassador to Russia, 
huge gaps show up in the files for almost four weeks in between the Sarajevo incident of 28 June 1914 and the Austrian dispatch of the famous ultimatum to Serbia on July 23rd. It turns out that it was actually a lot of the French and Russian files which went missing. Uh, the files, for example, related to the French presidential summit in St. Petersburg, which took place between July 20th and 23rd, 1914, right before the ultimatum is dispatched to Serbia, where it was later learned that, in fact, the Russians and the French both had prior warning about the upcoming ultimatum, and yet somehow we have no records of what they talked about or what they might have agreed. Um, so I think there's a real sort of an imbalance, and, and some of this I think does come out both in the historical literature, but it's also in the way the books are kind of packaged and sold. And part of the reason that I really like this title, why I would have preferred uh, the slightly more admittedly dry and anodyne title, which is also more accurate about Russia's aims in the First World War, is that that is really what I was trying to do with the book, to redress this gap in the literature, the excessive a uh, hypertropic focus on German war aims, German war guilt, to try to find out what the Russians and some of their allies, including also France and Britain, were actually up to, what their war aims were, after all, because they didn't, of course, fight for nothing. Um, but Harvard University Press, uh, long story short, they they wanted to sex up the book a little bit, to sex up the title, to, to sell it, that is. And so they came up with I'll admit I, I might have signed off on it, so I do bear some responsibility for agreeing to this, knowing that it would lead to endless grief on my part, endless pot shots by reviewers who would try to caricature my book as an attempt to pin all of the blame for the war on the Russians. And this has actually happened with my more recent book where I look at Russia's role in the Second World War, the book called Stalin's War. Once again, that was not really my title. I did go along with it. But so I have now been to some extent pigeonholed as the blame Russia guy. I'm the hysterical Russophobe who has blamed both of the world wars on Russian aggression. Uh, which is interesting. It's part of the reason why I've gotten so many media contacts and invitations since the Russian invasion of Ukraine in February of this year. Uh, many editors have asked me for copy, assuming that because I am known as the Russophobe who wrote these books blaming Russia for the two world wars, that I would take a hard, thumping, warmongering, uh, Russophobic line on the current conflict. And, and it turns out my views are actually a little bit more subtle than they would have liked, and so the editors haven't really been happy. I always prefer when people try to review books or talk about them or take pot shots at them that they actually read the books. And so if you read this book, you will say Russia is definitely restored to a kind of a central place in the story. Um, but it's not necessarily a blame game sort of a book where I'm trying to say Russia takes sole responsibility for the conflict. Chapter 2 is actually called It Takes Two to Tango. Uh, I got a lot of emails from people saying, well, but you blame Russia exclusively for the war. And, and I often respond by simply asking them, did you read the book? Did you read chapter two, which is about Germany and Russia in the July crisis? Uh, naturally, very few of them actually had read the book. Uh, but perhaps we should get to the book itself. So uh, could we now move uh, slowly over to this line here? See, this is another title I've been trying to popularize ever since I began working on the First World War. It's never quite caught on, though, the War of the Ottoman Succession, this being, of course, an allusion to the broader view, particularly in modern European history. There are all these famous conflicts, the War of the Austrian Succession, the English Succession, the Spanish Succession, which led to these conflicts over, in those cases, seemingly absurd questions over which royal house would inherit the throne and the legitimacy to this or that European nation. In this case, though, I actually did mean it a little bit more seriously Seriously. That is to say, the ultimate origins, the way I see this, I've sometimes used the analogy with American audiences that while you can't literally say that, let's say, slavery caused the U.S. Civil War, uh, it's pretty obvious that slavery was somehow involved in the origins of the war, which there was a lot of other talk of things like the secession of the southern states and states' rights issues, but obviously the, the kind of the core issue is slavery. Likewise, if you actually look at the First World War in the broader perspective, in the broader lens, where you're trying to find out where the problems were, where the tensions were, where the kind of heart, the fault lines of geopolitics were, they were quite obviously in the former Ottoman Empire. And in fact, there's even a lot of misunderstanding about this. There, there's a famous Bismarck line, which is often misquoted. Bismarck allegedly said uh, 
uh, that the entirety of the Balkans was not worth the bones of a Pomeranian grenadier. That is to say that Germany had no real interest in the Balkans. In fact, the term he used in the original German was den ganzen Orient. That is to say the entirety of the Ottoman Empire, he said, was not worth the bones of a single Pomeranian grenadier. Now, as we know, Kaiser Wilhelm II, after shoving Bismarck aside in 1890 and helping to kind of create this diplomatic fracas, which was then filled in when France and Russia signed their military alliance against Germany, he did not necessarily share Bismarck's view. And there were the Pan-Germans and a lot of other German imperialists who took a great interest in the Ottoman Empire. And I, I wrote about them in my book called the Berlin-Baghdad Express. Um, but Bismarck's line still contains an, an interesting kernel of insight. You know, he said it because he might have believed that himself, but obviously he felt that a lot of other people didn't. That in fact the Ottoman Empire might be worth a war, and that in fact if the war did break out, and this is another Bismarck line, which is probably apocryphal, but he said if it did break out it would be over, quote, some damn fool thing in the Balkans. Now it's interesting, I think a lot of the literature in the West has been distorted not just by this excessive focus on the Germans and German war aims, but because, of course, every war is different depending on where, it, where you look at it from. If you were in London or Paris or perhaps New York in the summer of 1914, in Europe everyone remembers the beautiful weather of that summer, and the war came as this kind of bolt from the blue. It came out of nowhere. Uh, David Frumpkin, who's best known probably uh, to people in this country as the author of a book called Peace to End All Peace about the Ottoman Empire, he wrote another book which didn't do quite as well. He called it Europe's Last Summer. And the metaphor he used in that book was that of clear air turbulence, something some of us might have experienced on an airplane when it suddenly goes into this sort of invisible turbulence and the, sh the, sh the seats start rocking and you hope you have your seatbelt on because otherwise if it's really bad you might end up bouncing off the ceiling, which does happen from time to time. And that's what he said happened in 1914. You know, Europe is just kind of cruising along and the West and the United States are just cruising along and then this conflict comes out of nowhere. You know, this utter shock. But, of course, that doesn't really make sense if you're looking at this part of the world, either the Balkans or the Ottoman Empire, which had just seen basically three major conflicts break out in the previous three years before 1914. Uh, to begin with, to go back to this broader map here, we have uh, the Italo-Turkish, or uh, Trabluzgarp, or triple Italian War, as it's sometimes called, when, again, for somewhat obscure reasons, um, uh, which dated back to the Berlin Congress, not the one where they talked about the Ottomans and the Balkans, that was the Congress of 1878 following the Russo-Ottoman War, rather the Congress of 1844, uh, sorry, 1884, 1885, where they discussed, among other things, the partition of Africa. And there was this curious concept about compensation, that if one power made a move in one part of Europe in their own sphere of influence, another power might demand uh, the compensatory right to make a move of their own. And so long story short, because French troops were sent into Morocco at the behest of the Moroccan Sultan, essentially to put down a tribal rebellion, the Italians said, naturally, this gives us the right to invade Libya. Naturally. Um, you know, which they did. They kind of drummed up a pretext, and uh, eventually they, they landed about oh, 30 or 40,000 odd troops. Uh, the fighting actually tended to bog down uh, particularly outside of the suburbs of Benghazi. This, this used to get a big sort of an arched eyebrow from people when I would mention Benghazi, which was so much in the news about a decade ago. And, and curiously enough, it was actually around Benghazi that some troops, uh, some, some um, trenches were dug, and eventually some future uh, leaders of the Ottoman Empire, including Enver Bey, future Enver Pasha, Generalissimo, also Mustafa Kemal, the future Ataturk, actually saw some serious battlefield action there. The curious thing about their entrance into this war, though, was that they were not actually able to travel there um, alongside any actual proper military transports. They actually had to sneak in by way of British Egypt, essentially incognito, um, and the reason, of course, was that it turned out that the Italians had firm naval control of the Eastern Mediterranean. Uh, the Italian fleet, including the Merchant Marine, was about seven times larger than the Ottomans by tonnage. And it turned out that all the Ottomans could basically do to resist what might have even been a direct assault on the capital by way of the Straits, that is to say the Dardanelles, 
uh, was to close off those straits, uh, effectively by lay laying literally steel chains across the water and, of course, mining the straits heavily, uh, which they did in April 1912. And among other consequences, this actually cut off Russia, essentially from her only warm water access to world markets. Now, Russia had been rapidly industrializing before this period over the past 20 odd years. Um, a lot of Russian industry, although a lot of it was further north around uh, Moscow and what was then uh, St. Petersburg, what is again St. Petersburg after many other name changes in between. Uh, there was also a lot of industry in eastern Ukraine. And so Ukraine in particular was heavily dependent on this traffic, uh, both in terms of imports of uh, machinery, components, industrial inputs, and also exports, wheat and grain exports, also of course significant today. We're hearing a lot about this in the headlines, about the cutoff of wheat and grain exports on which many countries, including Turkey are, of course, now heavily dependent. Uh, so geopolitically, this was quite important. And for the Russians, it was kind of like a, a stranglehold, really, over their own economic development on which everything else depended, social peace, uh, the, the reforms, although Stalipin actually dies. He's the, the reformer behind this, this campaign to try to kind of put more smallholders on the land in order to tampen down radicalism among the peasants. Uh, he's actually assassinated in September 1911, just days before this war begins. And so his whole program of kind of agricultural modernization, which is really meant to dampen the fires of radicalism and produce some type of a bulwark of conservatism and social order. All of it depends on the agricultural economy and agricultural exports, and all of this is now threatened and cut off because of the Italian-Turkish war. It's curious that, again, in the Western literature on the war, in addition to the, the focus on the Germans and German war aims, there are a lot of books, many of them quite popular and well-selling, including a book by uh, Robert Massey with the wonderfully evocative title of Dreadnought. Uh, which is all about the German Anglo naval race. Dreadnought being uh, the first kind of old big gun ship of the line, first launched in 1906, which in theory made other ships of the line obsolete because it could effectively blow them out of the water before they were in range. In practice, it didn't necessarily render them obsolete, it just made it very difficult for them to operate if there were dreadnoughts in the area. But the, the literature on the Anglo German naval race. Uh, tends to either glide over or leave out the fact that that race was basically over by 1911 because Britain had won. The Germans had more or less given up. What does start in 1911, though, is a serious naval race in the eastern Mediterranean. The Italians have proven the importance of naval power. The Ottomans have been caught effectively kind of with their pants down, unable even to supply an army in what is supposed to be an Ottoman province here. That is to say, Tripolitania, Cyrenica. The Ottomans have no way of supplying their armies here, so they are now in a desperate naval race. They're also going to be in a difficult position when the, the Balkan League, the four Balkan powers, Greece, Montenegro, um, Bulgaria, and Serbia, declare war on the Ottomans, piggybacking on the Italian conflict. It turns out that the Greeks also have superiority in the Aegean, which makes things very difficult for the Turks. And so the Turks actually begin ordering, of all things, dreadnoughts, and they order them from Britain. Curiously enough, the Greeks order them from Germany, um, despite the fact that, that Greece, there were many things aligning Greece with what would later become the Entente Alliance. Um, uh, if effectively, this is because of the personal ties of the Kaiser. His sister Sophie was Queen of Greece, married to King Constantine. And so the Greeks are ordering dreadnoughts from Germany. The Turks are ordering dreadnoughts from Britain. The Russians, because of the Straits Convention, once again in play today, although now it's called, of course, Montreux, going back to 1936. Uh, great authority on that uh, is my colleague, Onur Ischi. I highly recommend his work on the subject. But looking at this Straits question then, the problem for the Russians is they cannot import dreadnoughts like the Turks can, which kind of gives the Ottoman Turks an advantage. So Russia is starting to build her own dreadnoughts. It's actually not there at Sevastopol, what you can see on the map. You have to go a little bit further up to Nikolaev, or as it's called today, of course, by Ukrainians, Mikolaev. Uh, that's where the main kind of naval uh, dockyards were. And so the Russians start building their own dreadnoughts. But they're not expected to finish these until maybe the end of 1915. In practice, it takes even a little bit longer. They're not going to be ready, that is, for this new naval war until about 1916. Curiously enough, the Greeks were not expecting to receive their first dreadnought until 1915. The Ottomans, because they placed their orders a bit earlier and they placed them in Britain, 
they were expected to receive their dreadnoughts first. In fact, the first British state-of-the-art dreadnought built on spec for the Ottoman Navy was expected to arrive in July 1914. Uh, now, curiously enough, although it was quite well known uh, that a German mission, uh, originally led by a guy called Otto von Kehler, and then more famously by von der Goltz, later known von der Goltz Pasha, and then after uh, January 1914 by Liman von Sanders or Liman Pasha, the Germans were helping to train the Ottoman army. It's less well known that the British were actually helping to train the Ottoman fleet through the Admiralty. And in fact, many Ottoman naval officers were actually studying in Britain. And the Russians took note of this. They were actually in something of a panic. Uh, I, I read this one report actually in the Russian Foreign Ministry archives. Um, they were, they were in, a, in a spot of bother about the fact that for the first time, Ottoman naval officers were actually learning to swim which I think was a sign of how serious they were. Uh, but they were also obviously learning the, the latest techniques. There was a crew that was in fact all ready to take over the first Ottoman dreadnought at the end of July 1914 as the July crisis is kind of heating up when Winston Churchill of old people, first Lord of the Admiralty, um, commandeered those dreadnoughts before the Ottomans could get their crew on board. But so the clock was actually ticking in the naval race, but it wasn't the Anglo-German naval race. It was actually the Eastern Mediterranean naval race, a kind of tripartite race between the Russians up here in the Black Sea, the Greeks here, and of course the Ottoman Empire there. Um, and the Ottomans, it appeared, were actually winning the race. So where things actually stood then on the eve of Sarajevo, um, if we look here, I mean, some of the territorial changes are quite obvious. Serbia effectively had kind of doubled in size. Um, Serbia really was, Serbia was getting so big for its britches. This, this is another little known aspect of the diplomatic fracas before the July crisis, that curiously enough, the Russians did not actually take a pro-Serbian position because the Russians were concerned that if Serbia got a port along the Adriatic that Serbia would start to have this kind of right near Durazzo. Um, curiously enough, the Germans supported Serbia in this question and not the Russians. The Russians didn't want Serbia to get too big for her britches to actually think of herself as a great power. The Russians were also alarmed when the Bulgarian army made it to the Chitalja lines defending what was then Constantinople, today's Istanbul, because of course Bulgaria had her own designs on Hagia Sophia or Hagia Sophia. In fact, uh, Ferdinand of Bulgaria, who had begun calling himself Tsar, um, was actually said to sleep with a Byzantine emperor's regalia in his closet, ready for the time that he was going to ride in through the walls of Theodosius um, on a white horse. And so the Russians were also panicking about the Bulgarian threat to the Straits. Um, so the Russians had a lot of things they were concerned about in the years between 1912 and 1914. Contingency planning by the Navy, for example, is getting more and more frantic. The Russians were looking at things like, what if there's a major crisis and it looks like uh, war is actually going to come to Constantinople, Tsargrad, of course, as they call Istanbul. Will they be able to send in a kind of amphibious landing force, an expeditionary force? They were wargaming this out. You know, they were timing it. They were talking about mobilization day plus. This is the key term when you look at mobilization, like how many days after mobilization. And their plan was to get uh, the forces in both Odessa and Sevastopol up to speed so they could land troops at the Bosporus by about mobilization day plus five. That was probably unrealistic. This was the aim they were talking about. But the reason was because they really didn't know when the next crisis would break. And in fact, if you look at where things stood on the eve of Sarajevo, uh, which again is to say right before the war breaks out. Uh, no one was talking about the naval race between Britain and Germany. Uh, in France, mostly they were talking about a really Baroque sex scandal um, involving the man who should have been premier by lights after the May 1914 elections. That was Caillot. Um, no, what everyone in terms of the chancelleries and the foreign ministries, what they were talking about was they were expecting the Third Balkan War to break out between Turkey and Greece. Uh, as part of the backwash of the Balkan Wars, you had a major refugee crisis, another thing that we're seeing again in the headlines today. Mostly we're talking about kind of Muslim refugees from the Balkans fleeing the Christian Balkan armies into the Ottoman Empire and some Christians fleeing in the opposite direction or in the case of uh, the largely, though not obviously exclusively, Greek areas in and around uh, uh, Smyrna or today's Izmir, 
Uh, there was talk, the Greeks were complaining, that is, that the, that the Ottoman government was using this as like a pretext to cleanse the Greek population, to make room for the incoming Muslim refugees. And so the Greek government actually sent an ultimatum to the Ottoman government, you know, effectively, if you stop, if you don't stop doing this, you know, this is going to lead to serious consequences. And so the chancellors were on high alert, expecting that the Third Balkan War would break out. In fact, the Third Balkan War between Turkey and Greece did break out. Uh, it just didn't break out until May 1919. Effectively, it was postponed by about five years by the outbreak of the First World War, effectively because of the Sarajevo incident. And yes, with the mobilization of the armies and the German so-called Schlieffen, actually Schlieffen Moltke plan modified by Moltke, uh, in the end, the Western Front turns out to be the center of gravity in the war, at least in, in, if you're looking at things like ordnance and shell and kind of density of manpower and all the rest. But in terms of the actual negotiations over war aims, uh, the real action is actually further east. Um, yeah, the Dardanelles campaign. Oh, here we go. Okay, so this is, curiously enough, this is still relatively little known today, that both in the origins of the famous Gallipoli or Dardanelles campaign and even the origins of the so-called Sykes-Picot agreement for dividing up the Ottoman Empire, the initial move, the initial claims were actually made by Russia. And the states all the way back to November 1914, right after the Ottomans with their naval strike uh, on Russian ports in the Black Sea effectively launched the, the Russo-Ottoman part of the war. Um, that is that Russia began lodging these claims with the British Foreign Office. Now curiously enough, Britain, just as France had, had actually fought a war, if you remember the Crimean War back in the 1850s, to prevent Russia from, of course, gaining control of uh, her, her long desired for Tsargrad, along with all the kind of literal areas of the Straits. Um, and so there was some reluctance in Britain at first, but in the end it was thought it was important enough to keep Russia in the war, and that was really Russia's kind of trump card. She could keep threatening to fold effectively, you know, if you don't give us our way, we may decide that we have a kind of a problem with labor radicalism on our hands and we can't keep fighting the war. We'll kind of threaten to fold. And they actually do this in March 1915, basically at the height of the Dardanelles campaign before the Gallipoli landings when, you know, the, the German and Ottoman troops and their plunging mobile howitzers and their guns are battering the British Allied fleet, which of course included a lot of French ships. Which I always like reminding the Australians about this, obsessed as they are with the Gallipoli campaign. There are actually more French troops on Gallipoli than Australians. The Australians don't like being reminded of that. But the French are getting battered too. The French and the British are getting absolutely battered, and the Russians say, oh, by the way, you're supposed to give us this, okay? So this is actually what the Gallipoli campaign was about when it came to war aims, believe it or not. This is what was being negotiated at the time. Uh, I had a moment once on a BBC documentary and, and Neil Ferguson, this British historian, set me up for it quite nicely. You know, he asked, so, so, wh so what was it then that Mel Gibson was, is it really true Mel Gibson was fighting for the Tsar? He always gives himself the best lines. I can't even remember what I said um, in response. But I basically said, yes, you're absolutely right. They, they were there to win uh, Constantinople and the Straits for Russia. That's actually what they were negotiating at the time. Now, curiously enough, the Russians were supposed to be involved in the campaign. Everyone forgets this part, too. The Russians were supposed to land... Uh, well, actually, they, they were discussing this. Where should the Russians land? And uh, Sir Ian Hamilton, who was in charge of the British 29th Army, the kind of territorial sent over from Britain, who ended up taking the command of the ground troops at Gallipoli, uh, he was actually asked, after it all went sour and after Churchill's reputation was temporarily ruined, somewhat unfairly, because Churchill actually it was not Churchill's decision to try to conduct the campaign without ground troops. Rather, Kitchener said, you can't have any ground troops. And when Kitchener finally consented to send some, uh, he brought in Hamilton, and you know Hamilton said, "I knew nothing about Gallipoli and the Ottoman Empire. For me, it was could have been the land of milk and honey." And um, and so uh, Kitchener asked him, you know, where do you propose to land the troops? And he just looked at the map and he tried to kind of figure this out. And he said, "Well, I don't know. You know, maybe we should land the troops here. Maybe we should land them up here." Um, now, now. What, what about the Asian side, they asked. And it turned out, he said, no, actually, if you do get through, um, you should land uh, basically up here in Uskudar. Uh, I was actually over there today. Beautiful view. Um, and so Hamilton asked, well, so why should we land in Uskudar? And, and Kitchener tells him, because that's where you'll meet the Russians. The Russians were supposed to land 50,000 troops essentially up at the littoral of uh, the Bosporus. 
Uh, now, the Russians didn't actually land 50,000 troops, as you probably know. <laughs> they did send a kind of a naval probe in shortly after the Allied landings at Gallipoli, and they decided, well, you know, it's too heavily mined here. I don't think we're actually coming back. And so for the next, oh, six or eight months, as the British and French and, yes, Australian and, and New Zealand troops are getting battered on the Gallipoli Peninsula, the Russians quieted down a little bit about their claims for uh, the Straits. They didn't forget about them, though. And, and this is really interesting because I, I remember back, particularly in the years when, when ISIS was in the headlines and everyone was talking again about the Middle Eastern borders, I can't remember how many reporters I heard saying that the borders of the modern Middle East were settled by Sykes-Picot in 1916. The borders of the modern Middle East were settled by Sykes-Picot in 1916. Um, look at this map. Does this look like the modern Middle East to anyone? Is this, where's Iraq? Where's Syria? Where's Lebanon? It's really kind of strange. That doesn't look like the map of the modern Middle East. In fact, in many ways, it bears very little resemblance to it. This was the actual agreement in 1916, which was not Sykes-Picot. It was the sazonov sykes picot agreement, which was actually finalized in St. Petersburg at Chorister's Bridge in the Russian foreign ministry. So the Russian zone, you can see, actually, they, they got this part. Uh, they were also supposed to get this part, you know, the areas that... You know, the, the Armenians like to call Western Armenia or Turkish Armenia or Eastern Anatolia, as we would probably call it today. The Kurdish area here, which the Russians were referring to already somewhat provocatively as Kurdistan, along with much of northern Persia, this area of Persian Azerbaijan. Uh, it was kind of interesting that there's a little bit of amnesia about all of this. And a lot of this, of course, is because Russia succumbs to revolution in 1917. Very dramatic story. In the end, Russia... Uh, actually violated the terms of the so-called London Convention she had signed with France and Britain back in September 1914. Basically, they were not allowed to sign a separate peace with Germany, and the Russians, of course, did sign a separate peace with the Germans at Brest-Litovsk in March 1918, which essentially invalidated all these other agreements. But a lot of the post-war mayhem in the former Ottoman sphere actually goes back to this kind of disconnect. So it turned out that the whole premise of partitioning the Ottoman Empire in this way was, of course, Russian muscle, Russian troops. The Russians, after all, by the end of 1916, actually had taken some of these places. They had taken Erzurum. They had taken Trabzon. And they, had taken, they hadn't taken this part yet, no. But there was actual kind of a Russian army coming in. And, and in fact, if you look at the, the story of the Russian Revolution, it becomes in some ways more surprising the more closely you look at it, that in a lot of ways, Russia actually was winning in 1916. Russia was in a very strong position. Russia actually had plans for the final amphibious assault on Constantinople. Constantinople in the summer of 1917. And even after the revolution began, when uh, Pavel Milyukov, uh, who was the cadet, or we might call him a liberal, even if it's not quite the right word, who takes over a foreign minister of the so-called provisional government, um, the thing that actually forces him to resign in disgrace is that he refuses to renounce this, that is Russia's ambitions. Uh, there's, there's a kind of a press conference, a little bit of a scandal, and as he, had, he pointed out privately to a friend, it would be absurd and criminal to forfeit the greatest prize Russia could win out of this war in the name of some humanitarian ideal of international socialism. Well, the Bolsheviks, as we know, they disagreed, uh, at least temporarily, they were kind of anti-imperialist, and that was one of their big claims, one of the big calling cards was to end the war, and of course, basically, we don't want the Dardanelles, was actually one of their slogans um, in 1917. But so because Russia drops out and doesn't get this, um, I often like asking my American students this question, you know, so what happens to the Russian zones? Uh, to whom are they then offered in the post-war treaties, uh, initially at Versailles, uh, and then by the time we get to Sevres in 1920, it's kind of to some extent broken down. I don't remember whether I had the Sevres map on here. No, I didn't. But this, this is the key map here. Um, it turns out that because Russia's troops had dropped out and because neither Britain nor France by 1918-19 had enough troops to really garrison the Ottoman Empire in strength, um, they actually offered the Russian zones to the United States. They were supposed to take on the mandates for, you know, as they were then referring to it, Armenia and also, of course, the area around Constantinople and the Straits. Well, you know, history had other ideas. Woodrow Wilson, he was also about to have a stroke, the U.S. president, and it turned out there was not really a great groundswell of opinion in America, at least not in 1919, behind taking on a massive imperial role in the Middle East and perhaps sending a permanent occupying army of 100,000 or more. And so, of course, because the Americans didn't step in and the Russians weren't there anymore, 
Well, it turned out that uh, uh, the only troops really left um, were coming from Greece. And so this is why, effectively, Woodrow Wilson, he, he green-lighted the Greek uh, occupation first of Smyrna, and then eventually, of course, it came in through the bridgehead into the Ottoman Empire. The, the way the Allies manipulated him really is wonderful. I mean, I think it, it tells you something about both, uh, to some extent, the, the outsized role the U.S. has played in, in geopolitics since the early 20th century, but also, to some extent, the enduring naivete of many American statesmen when they approached the world. Um, now, it turned out that by now, Italy had gotten in on the game, too, and the, it, the Italian had this agreement at Saint-Jean-de-Maurienne, which they said gave them the right to occupy uh, the southern part of Turkey, basically from, you know, kind of like Antalya over up, really almost all the way up to Smyrna. Uh, everyone knows that Fethiye was part of the Italian zone, but the Italian zone was originally supposed to be much larger than that. And all the Italians could come up with, the new game at Versailles was that Woodrow Wilson had said he favored self-determination, and so you had to have an argument for why you know, your faction should take over this or that territory. And all the Italians could come up with was, well, this used to be a part of the Roman Empire. You see? And so this, this should be given to Italy. And, you know, Wood Wilson said, that's not going to fly with me. Uh, whereas Lloyd George and the British kind of explained to him, well, there are a lot of Greeks who live in Turkey. There are Greeks who live here, and there are Greeks who live up in the Black Sea. And there are even some Greeks in Cappadocia, uh, a lot of Greeks around Turkey. And so Greece has a good claim, and Wilson said, that sounds just fine. And so Woodrow Wilson, supposedly anti-imperialist, actually green-lighted the Greek occupation, uh, which again, to some extent, again, it was kind of a radical move, but on the other, it, it just kind of brought history back to what you might call its prior axis. Uh, the Third Balkan War thus broke out in 1919, having been delayed by about five years uh, by the First World War. Uh, but that said, certain themes, I think, are enduring, and I think we can all kind of pick out of this story uh, perhaps what we like to about Russia, certain Russian aims, again, to get back to not necessarily the Russian origins of the war, blaming Russia for the war, as I've often been accused of doing, but explaining that Russia was not a passive actor in the war, that Russia does have and has had and still has, of course, serious interests in this part of the world, which often lead Russia to behave in certain ways, uh, to kind of a, do a little bit of a sequel more related to my more recent book on, on Stalin's war, to some extent, the story of the Second World War II, I think, has been distorted a little bit by the almost excessive focus on everything that Hitler and Nazi Germany do. But if you actually look at the most consequential decision of the war, Hitler's decision to invade the Soviet Union, curiously enough, the proximate cause of that were questions having to do with the Balkans and with the Ottoman Straits and with Soviet Again, once again, enduring Russian foreign policy. So I'm not going to go into great detail here, um, but what is kind of interesting about this story, um, I think this map might be a little bit more useful. Uh, looking back at the question of the Straits, uh, we can see here the Black Sea. You can see on this map, once again, the question of the Straits and the access to the sea. Um, it's not generally known. It's known that there was, of course, a pact between Hitler and Stalin between 1939 and 1941. It's not generally that well known that Hitler actually invited Stalin to join the Tripartite Pact in 1940. Uh, it had been somewhat restyled cosmetically. Previously, it had been called the anti turn Pact, that is, anti-communist, often called in shorthand the so-called Axis powers, Italy, Germany, Japan. But, of course, the Soviet Union was also, and people forget this too, a revisionist power with many of the same territorial aims and ambitions as, of course, Tsarist Russia had shown in the First World War. Uh, so just briefly, when they get together and they try to adjudicate some of the conflicts that had been emerging between Soviet Union and Germany, even while they were semi-allied in this pact, uh, they met in Berlin in November 1940. And where the negotiations broke down, and you can literally see this in the real-time telegraphic correspondence between Stalin and Molotov, that is Stalin's instructions to Molotov while the negotiations were proceeding with Hitler and Ribbentrop, they actually had to do with Bulgaria and the Ottoman Straits. And quite literally, Stalin ordered Molotov to hone in on Bulgaria and the Ottoman Straits, by which Stalin meant this, he would not join the Tripartite Pact unless Germany withdrew troops from... Then they were also concerned about Romania and Finland, but the reason Romania was significant was both as a source of oil for the German Reich, but also a conduit for resources coming from Turkey and the Balkans, including in particular Chrome. Now, because Romania was significant, this also meant that Bulgaria was a sore point. 
uh, along with Turkey, major source of, of many uh, uh, resources, in particular chrome. But so what the negotiations finally broke down over was Stalin's demand for the right to station troops at the Turkish, no longer on him, in the Turkish Straits in Bulgaria. And when Hitler received this, essentially almost a kind of a, not quite blackmail, but a little bit of like a final offer, uh, there was one term that had to do with Sakhalin Island in Japan as well, but the real crux of the negotiations was over Bulgaria and the Ottoman Straits. And this is actually when Hitler blew up. And I discovered this document, believe it or not, in the Bulgarian archives, the 3rd of December 1940, when he received Stalin's blackmail, essentially the offer, I will only join your pact if you allow me to do this. He blew up in one of his famous tirades, three and a half hours, uh, with the Bulgarian minister to Berlin. You know, he simply said that the Balkans and Turkey were too important. He couldn't let Stalin have them. Um, now, it's interesting that Stalin was quite consistent, whether it was, of course, with Hitler in 1940, or with Roosevelt and Churchill later in the war, or even with Truman at Potsdam, uh, that these were all core Soviet interests. Uh, some of them, of course, to go back to one of uh, the Turkish maps, uh, some of them, of course, related to the old contested terrorists such as Kars and Ardahan, one of Stalin's, Stalin's famous demands in 1946. Uh, but effectively, this Straits question, which had been really the central question in Russian foreign policy in the decades before the First World War, remained as such in the interwar period and become to some extent even more pressing uh, during the Second World War and right on into 1945 and 1946. So I think we have to look at Russia, I think dispassionately, and these days that, that's maybe a little bit harder to do than it was previously in the wake of Russia's invasion of Ukraine. Um, it's not that we have to approve of Russian aggression or Russian behavior or Russia's role in the two world wars or in the recent war that has just, I suppose, escalated in Ukraine. There was already fighting, of course, in the Donbass even before February. Um, but I do think we have to understand how Russia sees the world. Um, to us, perhaps, Russia often comes off as an aggressor. The Russians obviously see themselves as often surrounded by hostile or perhaps unstable neighbors or those who might be intriguing with other powers. So that you could see Stalin making demands of Finland, for example, in 1939, because he thought Finland might become a launching pad for British or German intrigues. Uh, or the Russians seeing Ukraine, of course, as a perennial uh, sensitive point uh, for uh, the infiltration, that is, of potential hostile outside powers. Um, the thing is, Russia does have core geopolitical interests, um, and whether or not we approve of the way Russia sets about trying to handle those interests and impose her will on recalcitrant neighboring populations, I think if we ignore those interests, um, we will do so at our peril. And I think I'm going to stop there and open the floor for questions. waiting for the microphone. Good. I'll take a sip of water. Hi. Uh, is this on? Uh, can you hear me? Well, I mean, I guess... I can hear you. I'm All right. not sure the Great. microphone I'll, I'll is just on. ask I a question. I mean, this is mainly for... Ah, there you go. Got to put it here. Uh, I have two questions, Professor McMeekin, uh, Sean. Uh, the first one is an easier question, uh, and the second one is something that I'm struggling in my classes while dealing with students uh, who, I mean, my, my main problem is to do, has to do with the Soviet Union's, um, so the nature of Soviet foreign policy. The first question is, about Felix Chuev's memoirs uh, or interviews with uh, Molotov mm -hmm. that he conducted in the 1960s and 70s. Um, those were the, the interviews of a retired foreign commissar, right, the Commissar for Foreign Affairs, mm -hmm. who admitted later that some of the things that happened in the Second World War were a mistake or immediately after the Second World War as uh, Molotov declares later that you know he was he portrayed himself as an apparatchik. He portrayed himself as uh, 
I don't know, Stalin's handler, and I had to, I mean, he almost tries to reconstruct the narrative in a way that he had to do whatever Stalin told him to do, and, and yes, with his wife being held captive, etc., it's easier to believe that. My first question is very simple. Do you believe that Molotov was an apparatchik and Stalin was the master strategist? Um, that's my first question. Second question, it has to do with uh, Soviet imperialism. Now, this uh, is generally perceived as, uh, you know, with some a certain level of uh, bitterness from particularly the Turkish leftist circles and my students, when you claim that the Soviet Union, when my question is, when did the Soviet Union became uh, an empire? Uh, and, and I try to explain that in a way, uh, like by looking at the domestic. Uh, its policies of the Soviet Union, I tell them, look, so the Soviet Union was built as an anti-imperialist political entity, and somewhere in the 1930s there was a great retreat and a betrayal of the promises of the early you know, Bolshevism. If you look at it from the domestic perspective, this is what s the literature will tell you. Uh, but I, from based on my research, I will tell you that it's the Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact. If you're looking at a clear example of Soviet Union you know, displaying imperialist tendencies. It's uh, invasion of Poland, then Finland, etc. Uh, would you agree with that? And what's your mm -hmm. uh, what's your take on? W was it born as an anti-imperialist empire? Mm -hmm. Some people claim that. Well, that's a great question. I mean, maybe I'll I'll do the first one first because it is a little simpler. Um, you're right that Molotov could claim, for example, and it's a peculiarity of life under Stalin in the Soviet Union. You could have a, a foreign affairs commissar, effectively foreign minister, as we would call it in another country, whose wife was under arrest. <laughs> Same thing happened to the Soviet president, of course, head of state, Kalinin. I mean, Stalin did have a lot of different ways of keeping people under control. I mean, they, they actually passed a law in 1935 extending the death penalty down to children, I believe, as young as 12, so that he could not only threaten the wives, but also the children of Soviet officials to keep them in line. So I, I, I, I would credit the argument as at least plausible. Molotov himself would presumably know his own mentality. Um, and I did see, for example, what I was alluding to, that in some of the real-time instructions, um, he is constantly being chided and guided by, by Stalin. That is to say, he was not necessarily a free agent in terms of his foreign policy. This is equally true of Litvinov, his, his predecessor, whom a lot of people thought was genuinely believed in collective security and all the rest of it, but in fact, a very short leash. I mean, they, you know, he had a telephone where he had to be in constant touch uh, with, with Stalin. I think Molotov had a little bit more seniority. If anyone had a little bit of leverage, he would have had more than Litvinov would have, and because eventually he developed a bit of his own reputation. But, I mean, Stalin could keep him brutally in line. I mean, at, at Tehran, there's this famous moment when Churchill is objecting to Stalin's proposal to you know, mass murder German officers, and Churchill threatens to storm out of the room, and, and Stalin finally brings him back, says, I'm, I'm joking, and, um, and he says, oh, come here, Molotov, tell us about your pact with, with Hitler. Uh, <laughs> a, w a way of s also pretending, of course, that he had had nothing to do with that. Um, well, no, the, the broader question about Soviet imperialism, it, it's a fascinating paradox. You're right, this official, I suppose you could say the same thing about the United States, right? An officially anti-imperialist country is an imperialist, right? The Soviets start off that way. They have a great big, a, a series of anti-imperialist congresses. Uh, they even, as early as November 1917, they af effectively invite uh, what would now be called, I suppose, the republics to declare autonomy, if not independence, including Ukraine. One of the reasons why Lenin is kind of in a doghouse with Putin and other Russian Eurasianists and chauvinists today, because he helped to tear down the Russian Empire. Effectively, he was a kind of empire destroyer. Um, they do the same thing with the army, if you remember. I mean, initially, they're against the death penalty, and they want to get, once they're in charge, however, they behave differently, right? They, they want to bring back all the republics, even if giving them a little bit of autonomy. And they, of course, bring back the death penalty, and then some to the army. And in the same way, yes, certainly by the Stalin period, certainly by 1939, if not earlier. You could see it even earlier if you're talking about the attempt to bully Finland. That begins in 1938. Um, but no, I would agree that that's the, the point of no return where you can no longer really even pretend. That said, I do think it was somewhat baked into the cake. That is to say that, that the Soviets were perhaps fated to try to 
reconstitute some version of the empire. You can already see signs of that in the Civil War, when after all, they do fight to regain Finland, they do fight to conquer Ukraine, they tried to invade Poland in 1920, even if Poland kind of started the conflict, they would have been perfectly happy to occupy Poland and Germany had they been able to do so. Um, so yeah, so I think maybe that's the moment where you could say it's, you no longer have plausible deniability after 1938, 39, but I think it was kind of baked into the cake even before that. Did we have another question? I can ask another one. <laughs> yeah, or, or perhaps we could see if anything's coming in from the YouTube audience. Um, there, there, there nothing yet, no, okay. Yeah, go ahead. Um, so, uh, your book, your latest, I mean, th s s y the, the presentation you just made is uh, an earlier work of yours that, cur that kind of speaks to your most recent book, right? That, that builds on, mm -hmm. I mean, there are clear uh, similarities. Do you believe, this is one of the questions that I'm also struggling that when I receive, like, do you believe in continuity and, in, for instance, um, Russian foreign policy. Let, let me ask you a very contemporary question. And um, very recently, the Economist came up with a title of Stalinization uh, of Russia, right? And some historians objected to that, including Simon Seebach Montefiore. One of his books were translated by Yapukredi recently, who said that this is not a fair comparison because Stalin would have been disgusted to see uh, Putin's oligarchs, and, and after all, you know, there's a distinction, and you know, putting aside all his vices, etc. But I see, you know, I'm the, the, what I'm struggling to see is the following: like, think about Putin's article at the Kremlin website last yeah. year in 2021, and his 21st of February the sort of statements that Ukraine is not a nation; it's you know, then it's yeah, the other. Uh, what he's trying to get to there is that in Ukraine has always been part of Russia, right? And that in 1991, when the Soviet Union collapsed, it was weak. That's what he said, right? He said there were treaties that were imposed on Russia uh, when it was weak, which reminds me clearly of Molotov's remarks to the Turkish ambassador, Selim Sarper, in 1945, mm. when they're trying to uh, talk about uh, repatriation of Eastern Anatolian cities, he uses the exact same phrase. The 1921 Treaty of Moscow was signed when the Soviet Union was weak, right? Uh, and so there is that, you know, continuity there. Would you buy into this? I mean, in the West, there is this perception of Russia as, you know, growing by two kilometers per year sure. or per month, whatever, the defensive expansionism doctrine, etc. While looking at the recent events, do you agree that there is, uh, uh, to what extent you agree? And I think the wisest thing ever said about Thanks. Russia in this foreign policy was that Russia is never as strong as she looks. Russia is never as weak as she looks. The truth is usually somewhere in between. There are patterns, clearly. You're, you're talking about, let's say, Kars, Ardahan, um, I suppose Batum. I mean, in the end, they, they didn't lose that it was all three, but they, you know, they obviously lost two of the three at a moment of weakness, as you point out, at the end of the First World War. Um, just as, let's say, at the end of the Cold War, Russia loses, of course, the Baltic states and Belarus and, and Ukraine, um, along with the, the Central Asian Constituent Republics, obviously what used to be the Transcaucasian Federated Republic, uh, the countries of the Transcaucasus. So Russia obviously lost a lot at a moment of weakness, and Ukraine is, you're right, if you talk about Putin in this now somewhat infamous article about the historical unity of Russians and Ukrainians published on the Kremlin website. I mean, what I found fascinating about that article um, was that so much of it has to do with czarist history. That is to say, he, he's definitely interested in the early Soviet period. He's interested in lessons you can learn from the Soviet period, from the period right after the First World War. Um, but he obviously is trying to draw on this deeper history. And, and I do sometimes try to point out to Americans that you know, they may be wrong about Ukraine today, let's say, and Ukraine's identity today. Um, but if they're talking about the history of the Russian Empire, well, it is true that Ukraine, Novorossiya, and the parts of Ukraine, nearly all of what is now Ukraine, at least certainly the eastern half, had been incorporated by 1783. And so, let's say in American terms, we're a very young country. 
Eric, all the Articles of Confederation, even before the Constitution was promulgated. So it's, it's a long time, in other words. Of course, Ukrainians today would say, yes, yes, yes, but that's old history. And, you know, we have the history of the 20th century, and we were independent for a while in 1918 and 1919, and they still celebrate this. And, and uh, then, of course, they suffered in the Holodomor of the early 1930s. They suffered horrendously in the Second World War and in the period of the late 40s, renewed famine. Um, and so they had the Memorial Ruch in 1989 to try to kind of draw on these memories to create a new nation. Uh, Putin's certainly right that Russia was very weak in the early 1990s and really right on through this period in the late 90s when NATO expansion began quite famously and perhaps fatefully. And so you can understand this Russian point about being taken advantage of at a moment of weakness. It is interesting, though, that there's nearly always a territorial claim involved. That is to say, it's not just the symbolism of being humiliated when they're weak. It's also the idea that they lost territory. And perhaps this is just the nature of a land empire that kind of has always, to some extent, reckoned uh, her place in the world in terms of, of, of the land holdings. And, and, and Ukraine, again, to be fair to the Russian point of view, Ukraine's a very important country. We're talking about its location, its geopolitical significance, its economic importance, its economic role. I mean, we're all feeling that today. Ukraine has been, to some extent, severed from the world economy, and so you're talking about everything from uh, the famous wheat and the grain to fertilizer exports and potash and you know, a lot of industry. Um, for the Russians, it's hugely important. I mean, to take uh, one of my old mentors who used to teach here in Turkey, Norman Stone, had, had a great line. You know, he said that, with Ukraine, Russia's the United States, a superpower. Without her, she is Canada, mostly snow. Um, and, and perhaps that's not fair to either Ukraine or Canada, but you kind of get the point. That is to say that Russia's, her very pretensions to being a great power and being taken seriously as a great power do depend on Ukraine. So that, that Putin, and, and it's also quite famous that he has a little bit of an obsession with Peter the Great. You might say it's a little bit of a two-edged sword because, of course, Peter the Great never did conquer Ukraine. <laughs> that was really left up to Catherine the Great. And yet, to some extent, Peter the Great brought about Russia's emergence as a great power, as a European power, as a military power to be reckoned with. And so this is obviously a point of pride, a point of importance for Russians. And so I think that, yes, the, that sort of sore point you're getting at, moments of weakness, whether it's the end of the First World War, whether it's, again, 1920, whether it's um, 1990, 91, 94, the Budapest Memorandum, or perhaps some of these flashpoints in the late 90s, the Kosovo War in 99, uh, NATO expansion between 1994 and then 2004 when NATO moved into the three Baltic countries, a time when Russia was destitute and, and weak. Um, it, it's clearly a complex. You know? So it's not just the geopolitics and the economics. It is also this kind of almost complex about great power status and, and pride. That, and again, we think, we think Putin is alone in this feeling, but obviously... A lot of Russians feel this way. I mean, if you look at the recent approval ratings, it's, it's quite remarkable. Even since the war started, they seem to have actually gone up. You know, so it's not a view just of one man. I mean, it's clearly something that's widely shared among Russian elites and even, I think, a lot of common Russian people. Well, thank you all for coming. Geldeniz için çok teşekkür ederim.